Welcome to the Freedom Focus series on the Fearless Tips and Talks podcast. We've got something special for you because we are going to interview approximately 10 guests who have found freedom in a particular area of their life. I'm so honored to take you through this chain-breaking series where we dive into specific topics that bombard our daily living. We want to equip and inspire you to walk in freedom from fear and anxiety in a world that feeds it. Welcome to Fearless Tips and Talks Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Bulwer. Today, I have Justin Stewart, and he's known as Stu, in the studio, kicking off our first interview for the Freedom Focus Series. And so today's topic is setting our minds free from mental overload. I think it's pretty fair to say that we're a little bit overloaded. Our minds are overloaded. We're exhausted. So I'm excited to really dive into this topic with you, Stu. But before we dive in, I want to tell our guest a little bit about you. So Justin Stewart is a seasoned coach, mentor, instructor, trainer, detective, and quick reaction force team member. Whew, excited to get into that and see what all that means. In 2019, Stu founded the Guilds Men Fellowship. Uh, He works with uh, first responders and military members, and the Guild is a network of men living on mission, purpose, rich lifestyles. Okay. So, Stu, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. I want to get a little bit into what you do and how you're helping men because it's uh, pretty captivating. So, tell us a little bit about the Quick Reaction Force team. Oh, (laughs) Um, it basically just means I'm halfway a cool guy. (laughs) Uh, it's just that, so that's what I do for like my, you know, professional job, right? you know, my day in day out. Um, essentially I I'm in law enforcement, which most people do know. I don't talk a whole lot about like what my exact positions are in there. Um, just for the benefit and safety of the people that I work with myself, my family, et cetera. Um, Quick reaction force is basically just a it's a it's a response to critical scenes. We're basically a bridge between patrol and and an actual SWAT team is Mm. what we do. So um, on there, uh, I use I'm the the shield operator, which sounds like a really cool title. It essentially just means I'm the smallest guy and the easiest one to shoot around. (laughs) Okay, then. (laughs) So Yeah, it's um, it's a good job. Um. I've always kind of felt like God has given me the resilience as a man to be somebody who's willing to shoulder burden. Mm. And that has uh, given me a lot of blessings, a lot of opportunity. Um, You know, I got into living a service or an on-mission lifestyle late in life. I avoided it young. And um, yeah, just, just being part of that team where it's like, Hey, just give me the hard and heavy mm-hmm. and I'll go and I'll trust that God's going to put me where I need to be. And that, um, that I have the capability of formulating a plan, falling in line, assimilating to a plan and uh, taking care of what needs to be taken care of. So that's, that's kind of hopefully answers the question. It is. So that's your day in, day out. But now you've got this mission work that you do as well. Tell us a little bit about that, how you got started, and maybe how your journey started to help men in this in this way. And I'll warn you, I am a bit of a talker. So if I start <laughs> taking up too much time, feel free to just say, hey, that's, you know, okay. wrap okay. it up. Um, no, you know, when I was younger, I was in a couple of different bands. Well, I was in a band for a little over a decade Got into the tattoo industry, um, you know, not necessarily living the worst kind of life, just not a really super good life either. Um, I talked about it on a veterans podcast a little while back. You know, I'm a, I'm a 9, 11, 18 year old, you know, so I watched friends go while I stayed behind. Mm-hmm. I always kind of carried around an amount of guilt with me, um, which to, at this point sounds silly after I've unpacked it all. But It led me to where I found myself living in the back of a tattoo shop about 2,000 miles away. I had had, my wife and I now had decided we were going to move out of state and open a tattoo studio. And, you know, she's a chiropractor and she was going to get a practice going. We're going to do all this stuff. And I moved them there. 
And I think she knew before I did it wasn't going to be a good move. And um, I was stubborn. I was the man, right? I was like, mm-hmm. we said we we're going to do this. I'll make it happen. You know, hope is not a good plan, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, she got out there and it just it wasn't working. And I just remember all these different things going on. You know, I was like drinking um, and everything was like under the sh- under the mask of like justification. You mm-hmm. know, it was like. Uh, it's okay that I drink because I don't drink during the day. I'm not getting arrested. I'm not getting in domestic assault situations. I'm not doing all the things that your classic person who drinks too much uh, does. So I must be fine. Mm. Ignoring the fact that it would be like every night the shop would close and I would drink like 108 ounces of alcohol okay. before I come home and go to sleep, you know, every single day. Um, so, yeah, all of that and just realizing – Something is um, is amiss. Something is not good. And I remember one day my wife, who was never really religious, we were both raised in religion and, and stuff, and and just never really, never really found God in it, you know. And one day she's like, "I want to go to church." And I had just burdened myself for so long that I just wasn't open to the idea of something being out there for me. So I, I kind of laughed it off and, um, you know, just to like make it short, it, it laughed at her essentially. And so she cried and I'm like, well, I'm a jerk, but I'm not that much of a jerk. You know what I mean? So it was like, I'll go with you. I'll support you. And when we find out that these people are hypocrites and, you know, they all have problems just like us, then we're going to, we're going to be done with this. And I went there and it was the the stereotypical, all the lights in the church went off, but this, but the spotlight on me and everyone disappeared. And the pastor was like, you're trash. God is telling me to tell you you're trash and you cannot, you know, uh, not really so intense, but that's how it felt okay. to me. It was a big moment. And, um, yeah, I just, I started seeing, man, I got a lot to do. I got a lot of work to do. And, I, I think it all, the whole ministry side of it started. I told my wife when I quit drinking, I quit drinking about seven years ago. Congratulations. That's thank, wonderful. Thank you. And um, I uh, I told her when I hit a year, I'm going to help someone. Right? Wow. Why a year? Uh, I guess I felt like I didn't have anything to offer until I had hit some benchmark. Okay. So here's the funny thing about it is the weekend after I quit drinking, I was at a, t- I had to perform a tattoo convention. Um, and then I think it was two weeks after I quit drinking or somewhere a week or two after I quit drinking, the band that I was currently in at that time was going on like a Northwestern tour. So now suddenly I'm doing all these performances and touring with a sober mind. And I have always been adamant. I'm, I'm a little intense, right. With stuff. Um, when I decide to quit something or not do something, whenever I have like thoughts of doing it, um, I kind of go like, you know, there's this guy, David Goggins. I don't know if you know that, but it's even before knowing about him, I always would just go to like, yeah, go ahead and do that. You know, since you're so weak, since you're so incapable, since, you know, I would beat myself up Mm -hmm. the opposite way, right or wrong. I've managed to quit drinking and I've had the same bottles of alcohol in my house since the day I said I don't drink anymore. Wow. Put your mind to it. You're going to do it. It just is what it is, you know? And I'm not saying that to be boisterous. What I'm saying is, so that's how I wound up in these situations where it's like, I'm going to go on tour and I'm going to do everything I did before. And I learned a lot about what wasn't serving and what was good. Um, But to kind of tie this in, I was at this party and I remember talking to this guy and him being like, what is it like to be here? You know, not drinking and just whatever. Like, what is your situation like? And, um, you know, he he and I talked for quite some time. And so on my year, when I was finally worthy of talking about not drinking, right, or, or self-development, I put up a post. And I do it every year. And it's it's to glorify God. And it's also to say, hey, this this type of lifestyle it exists and is available to you also. And uh, this guy messages me and he says, hey, I don't know if you remember me or even or if you remember our conversation or even me. Uh, but, you know, X amount of time Was ago he the guy at the party. Mm-hmm. Wow. And he's like, I've been I thought a lot about what you said and I've been sober for about nine months. Oh, 
It's so great. So it's just like, I'm like, whoa, you know? So <laughs> I wind up and it's still like, even today, yes. like it, it kind of, I, I get that reaction to it. And, uh, you know, I just thought, man, I'm like proud of myself. Like, thank you, God, all these different things. I'm proud of that guy. And then also like, what a bunch of missed opportunities. Wow. You know, <laughs> so it's really, you can, you can ask, you know, Tyler knows well, for me, it's, it's very, it's very intense, you know, like I'm just that way. It's like the, the wage of failure to the guild is death. You know, like there's just no other, there's no other truth to it. Mm. Um, it just, all of these things led me to realizing that we all, none of us are unique and we all have things to share with each other that will help each other get through these things. We're all suffering mm. different things the same ways, mm. you know? Um, and I'll, I'll say that again for the people in the back, we're all suffering different things in the same ways, That's good, you know, and, um, just realizing it's like, that may be true. And yet such a small percentage of us are trying to organize networks and systems, you know? Um, and then I look at, I look at, you know, we don't only work with law enforcement and military guys. We work with men to service, um, men that want to do more than they are serve something bigger than them. You know. So, Stu, t- you, you mentioned Tyler. Tyler is your friend and also sounds like co-laborer for the men's ministry that you're running. He's in the studio today for those of that, that can't see it. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about this men's ministry and how it got started and formed. I mean, was it birthed out of that moment where you realized a year later you spoke about it and now you're going to help people? Was that just a little bit of the, the, the blocks that started or when did it actually became something in 2019? I think is what it said. So, um, you know, people laugh at me maybe a little or like, Ooh, when I say this, but, um, you know, God spoke this into existence. And so I want to be very clear when I talk about like what I mean when I say talking to God. So, uh, I have this bush that's in my house, like a little plant. And when I'm like feeling isolated, I will put a little fuel in it and I'll light it on fire and then it speaks. Just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but, but you know, when you say, I, I do that for a reason. When you say you talk to God, people are like, whoa, like, hey, you know, okay, so right. you're a Bible thumper. Or you're, right. You know, and it, it shuts the conversation off. What I, what I mean is that I started feeling God's presence so innately, viscerally, mm-hmm. like in my physiology. Mm-hmm. And... um I started realizing like it, it just felt so real to me that there that God is trying to communicate. Yeah. Not with words, you know, but in spirit. And uh so I would do um Napoleon Hill, I think stole it if you're familiar with who that is, but he he called it sitting for ideas, right? Um, he talks about how he went to some meeting and, and the CEO he was gonna interview left him sit for hours and the guy comes out and he's like, What are we doing? He's like I was sitting for ideas and they just didn't stop. He's like, so you were just literally sitting and thinking. And that's why I waited. He's like, yeah, they they wouldn't stop coming. I had to keep writing. Mm -hmm. You had to wait. So I would start doing that with God. I would go literally on my balcony. I would light a cigar, excuse me. And I would call it my kitchen timer. And, uh, I would just light that cigar and I would just be there and I would go out and I'd maybe put on some ambient music and be like, what is it? God, tell me what it is. And, uh, this is what it was. And over time it grew. It's actually, so we say 19, it actually started probably more like in 16. Okay. But it was in 2019 where one of my, uh, like private coaching clients, I was taking some clients at that time. Um, I had been kind of telling him what I was wanting to do. And he was like, well, when are you going to start it? And yeah. I was like, oh, I got to perfect it. It's got to be, you know, there has to be no flaws and <laughs> He said, well, I can think of two people it's not serving now. And the caveat to that story is right about that same time, my wife said, shut up and do it or stop talking to me about it. Wow. <laughs> Basically, you know, nicer than that. Love you, babe. But <laughs> but it just it it just kind of grew. And it was like, we really, really got to we really got to see this out. And, and we try really hard. We We do work really hard to keep it organic, to keep it as a conduit. And not something that we're forcing. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's that's 
That's the short end. That's so good. Stu, our topic today is overcoming mental overload. And as I'm listening to you speak, I see a man who is strong mentally, who probably never has had fear or anxiety or stress that shows up to a situation and just knows what to do, especially in these critical scenes that you're talking about. And it sounds like God has blessed you to be able to carry the burdens of other people in these situations. However, how did you get that strong? You know, there's men listening that are like, well, I'd like to quit drinking, or I think I should do X, Y, Z, or I really need to, you know, use my pain for purpose, but I'm scared or I'm not ready to do that. Like, how did you get mentally strong? So I want to be, I want to be careful with my wording here. Um, I didn't, I, so I didn't get mentally strong. I exist as that, right? And not because I was born or because I'm different or because I'm unique or whatever, but because, um, you know, the world occurs as the world occurs and God is consistently available, right? So, it's not that I got mentally strong. I, I think like the way I see it is at some point I just said, use me for what you will, you know, and it's not as if I'm like really good at that either. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I think it, 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 it really just comes down to, and this is such a big question. I'm trying to give you like the best answer I can. It, it's like want versus intrigue, I guess would be a good a good skill. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, we all have the ability to do all of these different things and to be more than we are and to be more on mission and, and to, to serve God more efficiently. Right. And so it's a skill set that's developed, you know? So one of them is identifying want versus intrigue. So a person may say, I want to quit smoking cigarettes or I want to quit drinking alcohol. And then not do it. So maybe the same day they're like, yeah, I want to quit smoking. And then they'll light a cigarette in the next moment. And, uh, when I think about that, it's like, if I, st- if I tell you, if I look you in the face and I say, I want to do something and then in the next breath, I don't do it. What I've done is I've called my, I've made myself a liar. Right. And so now I'm feeling guilt because I said I wanted something, which is essentially the same as saying I will do something and I didn't follow through. And so now I'm a liar. Right. And so one of the ways that I think I have given the appearance of being so much stronger and that's kind of an egotistical way to say it. I don't mean it like that. One of the ways that I've given the appearance of somebody who you might look to if you wanted to quit drinking or do these other things is because I've separated want and intrigue into two categories. So now I know the difference. So when I'm like, you know, I just quit chewing tobacco recently because my wife and kid asked me to, and they had asked me numerous times, but this one time it was just big. And in the moment that they asked me, I had already been interested in it. I had been telling myself I'm interested in what it looks like to not have to like pop a can every five, five minutes and dump tobacco in my lip. And it became a want, I guess is what I'm getting, like a true want, a want, a will do. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It sounds like you're trying to say that you have to pass out of intrigue into want to really make it happen. Otherwise, you're just intrigued about the idea. Yeah. I'm interested in what my life may be like if. So I'll give you another example. So, you know, talking about QRF or being a shield operator or whatever, um, you know, like to me, that's no, not some huge, it's a big deal because I care about the people I work with. I care about the community members. I care about my own life and stuff, of course. Um, and yet when it's time to go and do that work, like everything is an exact want. I want to, you know, I want to go and accomplish the mission. I want to survive accomplishing the mission. I want to do all this. There's no, not a question about it. Um, and I just recently spoke to somebody about this, the jujitsu side. I like to do jujitsu. When I go to do a competition, I experience fear, right? And anxiety. Uh, I go back to wanting to validate externally, right? And so the way I see the difference between the two is a jujitsu competition isn't like life and death. I have all these like, well, what ifs, or maybe I just, or, you know, whatever things that happen when that's going on. 
But in route to a life or death situation, it's just like it's the same two things every time, right? It's, you know, take a quick dialogue with myself. Where's your heart rate? And I check my heart rate. I get it to where I want to go. And then I just pray to God. It's a peaceful and nonviolent God, peaceful and nonviolent. We say amen, and we just go and we just do what we went there to do. And there's that's, and that's what it is. So what I hear in that situation is there's not a lot of overthinking. And yeah. I feel like men and women both will step into situations. Now you're talking about some big situations, some jujitsu and, and some critical scenes. I mean, those are big situations, but like the less we can overthink things, it sounds like the, I mean, you're, you sound like you make things simple. Like I just go, I just show up. I give, I pray, I, I get still with God. And, and that seems to help you not have a mental overload. How did you develop that discipline of like, I, I check my heart rate. I know what's right. Like, I mean, surely there's some experience behind all of that where you failed and failed and failed and failed. And now you know how to, how, how to calm yourself. Yeah. You know, I guess, I mean, that's a great question. I guess maybe I should, I should probably write out that more clearly so I can use it as a block of instruction at our program. But Please do. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I honestly, I can't answer that because I don't really know how, um, I know some what's, I know some what's that I did. Um, you know, you mentioned showing up. I did that. I started doing that. Um, you know, I, I started in the jail, working in the jail. Um, I would go there when I started in the jail, I was a 30 something year old man starting at 1239 an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, when I told my wife, I'm leaving the tattoo industry, I am not happy here. It's not providing me any mission, any purpose. I'm going to go be a cop and a mentor. She was like, what? <laughs> You know, and I just knew God was calling me to that. And I just showed up. I just said yes. And just over time, um, because there's a couple words that you've said that when, when those words are said, they don't – like I don't picture me when I hear those words. And those words are simple and disciplined. <laughs> you know, like I just don't. And he's probably over there, which I know you guys can't see, but he's over there chuckling because he knows, he knows the inner workings, right? Like we're just sitting on a podcast and I'm just giving you like the outer edge of, of some content with a little bit of my context. But, mm -hmm. you know, come to a stations right before we do our program when we're like hours before it starts and, and see how neurotic I am. Right. And see how like mission focused, how like nothing outside of what we came here to do is excusable. The standard is absolute devotion. Right. And how like, woo, spun up I get. Um, I just, it's just in the practice of that, you know, knowing, knowing what matters most and, and just showing up for it over and over and over and over again. Hey friends, interrupting this awesome interview with Stu for a moment to tell you about a way to support and partner with Fearless Tips and Talks. I really hope that you found this podcast to be a staple in your week. I love producing free, valuable content each week to help you find freedom from fear and anxiety in a world that feeds it. Something that is incredibly special to me is hearing that you can't wait for new episodes to drop. So I promise as long as Lord willing, I'm going to keep producing producing high quality, valuable, impactful, life-changing podcast each week, completely free. So even though we love producing this content, we do need you to know that this podcast isn't free for us to produce. So that's why we're rolling out Podcast Plus today. For as little as $5 a month, you can subscribe to Podcast Plus and support our efforts to keep delivering incredible content to you. With your subscription, you'll receive the peace of mind that you are supporting a nonprofit ministry that's helping thousands of people overcome fear and anxiety. Plus, you're going to get access to exclusive bonus content each month. And this content is awesome too. Our first bonus that we're going to roll out is Tim Azell and Faith McDonald, which have been some of our most downloaded podcasts. You're not going to want to miss those bonus episodes. If this podcast has made an impact in your life, I would cherish your support. Join Podcast Plus today. The link is in the show notes or go to www.fearlessunite.com backslash podcast. That's fearlessunite.com backslash podcast. You just mentioned complete devotion. 
I wonder if some of the reason why our world is so mentally overloaded is because of distraction. I actually kind of honor you right now thinking like, I just show up and it's absolute devotion. How many times do we get into situations or we show up at things and we're so, you said it's neurotic, you think it's neurotic, but really, could that be the recipe that we're missing? Like show up and be devoted. I mean, I think there's just so many people like just blowing in the wind and they have no idea where they're going next, you know, so it's like you, you, you seem to be very devoted to the mission and it's just help as many people as possible. And it's like, I don't need a formula. I don't need a, like a specific curriculum. I just need my life experience and my trust in God. And perhaps we're overthinking church. Perhaps we're overthinking ministry, perhaps, you know, so I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm seeing this theme woven in is just like, keep it simple, stupid. Like for me, it's what I'm thinking. Like, why do we overcomplicate things? So I don't know, speak into that a little bit. Like, do you think, you know, simple devotion could be a recipe to helping us just not being so mentally overloaded? I definitely think so. Um, you know, like for me, it's like, People will say like, oh, the things you do in the guild are really good and da, 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 da. And they say, you know, and it's like, thank you for appreciating, you know, like I don't want to not be grateful to people acknowledging hard work. You know, it's it's not as if it's not as if like I just snap my fingers and things happen. So I am appreciative when people say stuff like that or like, oh, thanks for your service or, you know, whatever. Like, yeah, yeah thank you. The The other side of that is as much as I'm doing this for other people. I'm saving my own life. Mm. You know what I mean? So when I say like the wage of failure is death, I don't mean like for, for just you, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you can look at that lots of different ways. You know, um, imagine what the man, assuming he would still be here, you know, seven years later after drinking 108 ounces of alcohol every day, you know, assuming he didn't, you know, I'm going to get intense for a second. Assuming that guy didn't put a gun in his mouth yeah. or have liver cirrhosis. Imagine the conversation that would be here, mm. you know. And um, when it comes to simplicity, it is like it is kind of just just show up. You know, I mean, we have curriculum, um, but we'll tell the guys, you know, when they get there during we call it intake and onboarding where the guys that come to our program, uh, they get to stations and we're like, hey, this is. This is how it's going to work. We've got some things we're going to follow, and yet, um, you know, what happens will happen, and it's our responsibility to find lessons in everything. Mm -hmm. You know, the world occurs as the world occurs, and God is constantly ready to leverage. You know what I mean? And to help you leverage. Um, so, yeah, I think just, you know, I'll, I'll give a head nod to my copper friends out there, you know, or, well, really first responders and, and military guys in general. It's like, you know, one of the crazier scenes that I've ever gone to was a random check the well-being, you know, and the guy that I was partnered up with at the time was going to go. I just went because the day was kind of – there's nothing going on. I was like, I'll, I'll – bebop on over there for you and then after we're done we'll hang out and talk about whatever again and we got there and it became clear like something is weird we got we both had the spidey sense and there's like a thing it's like two or more cops feel some type of way you mm. should probably slow down okay you know and um the long story short on that is by the time we situated and went to knock some dude come opens his garage door and comes out at us with a rifle <laughs> you know and we're like whoa you know, so I think as we were moving on, I'm thinking, like, how did you develop a skill set? And, and think of that, like, just showing up. It's like, I think that's maybe it, you know, just uh, just realizing that, like, you just keep answering the call, you know, not knowing what's going to be there when you get there. Just knowing that you're just like God going to be willing to try to leverage whatever comes for good, mm. you know. There's so many people that are listening right now that are maybe stuck in their own thought loop of insecurity, fear, worry. I can't help someone. I'm not good enough. Or I haven't hit the year benchmark yet, so I don't think I should. Would you talk to the man or woman listening on the other side that is afraid to move forward? 
is afraid to step out. Because what I hear in your story, what I also hear in my story is my pain turned to purpose. And being in a fetal position with suicidal thoughts and the most severe panic and anxiety disorder situation I've ever had, now I'm sitting, having a conversation with you, putting content out into the world that helps literally save lives. And I hear you saying, like, pain turns to purpose. Use your pain for purpose. Don't be afraid to do that. Step out, brother. Step out, sister. Don't try to figure it all out. Just go. And and when you do that, there's there's joy and happiness. And it doesn't mean it's not going to be excruciating or hard or a guy's going to show up with a rifle. You know, like, like there's going to be some hard stuff in this world. We will have troubles, but take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. How do we do that, Stu? Like, how do you encourage someone to step out and just do it afraid? So we have an exercise, we call it YANU, because all the men in our program love acronyms, you know, so we try to make as many as possible. I like a good acronym too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We call it YANU though, it stands for you are not unique, and we touched on this a little earlier. And the exercise is basically just somebody says something that they've experienced or something that they think or something that they feel guilt or shame over or whatever it is. And any man that's in the room that resonates with that in any way just puts his hand up, right? And it's and it's an exercise intended to show that there are networks, right? When there's we say when there's one, there's two, you know. And um, I just remember, like, I'll give just a quick story. I remember one time we did that exercise, and I always I always go back to this. And one of the guys in the room says gets quiet and he says i have suicidal thoughts Mm. you know or something along those lines and a room with 13 participants raised its hand the entire room wow and to where like it's still woo you know what i mean it's such a such a like wow moment that you're like i don't know what to like at least me the facilitator going i don't know what to do now right so keep it simple it's like Stop, pause, let's talk. And so why that's relevant, like what that means is this, you know, and I'm going to look at the camera. So for you that's sitting out there that's watching and, you know, maybe, and this is how we play ourselves. Even in this moment where I'm saying like for you and you're looking and we're looking, you're like thinking not me or he's just looking at the camera like whatever. No, I'm talking specifically to you. When we acknowledge that we are not unique and we acknowledge the fact that since we are not unique, somebody needs a piece of what we have, we're forced to acknowledge that what we fail to give is a take from the world. And that is what I learned. And that's why I share. It's like I know that my failure to share what is happening with me is a take from someone who thinks they're unique. Right? And so don't make it about you. Make it about them. And that's how that's how I think we solve that problem. That's how weakness becomes strength, right? That's how fear becomes courage. It's like I don't really want to tell people that at one point in my life I experienced a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, um, that I had – I suffered from the symptoms of alcoholism, right? I don't really necessarily want to talk about that. But what I do want is for you to not have to, right? For you to maybe, or if you already are, for you to be able to step out of it too. And and because in some ways that helps sanctify me, right? That helps me practice forgiveness, the ability to give love to the world the way I did before I was a drunk, you know, jerk that made my wife cry or moved my family to California, Hmm. you know? I can I can give to the world and to God or to to myself to God to everyone in a way that I would have before it all happened before before all the hurt and harm set in. Stu, your story is incredible. There's been many moments of chill bumps all over, and I <laughs> am grateful for the work that you're doing in and through the world. Is there anything you'd like to end today on mental overload or anything you didn't get to share that you'd like to share right now? You know, there is, there's a scene we play and you can look it up on YouTube, 
Braveheart, right? Every man has seen Braveheart. Oh, yeah. Right? That's a great movie. Um, but there's a scene where after they kill his wife and, and they want him to surrender and whatever, and he rolls up there. And he's on a horse and he's got his hands up like this. And it's just very long. And the drums are like, boom, boom. And it's, everything's just building. It's very suspenseful. When you're feeling overload, watch that, watch that scene. And, um, you know, and I know that for men, it's, it's very true that that, that is the feeling and it may be for women too, right? That is the feeling that I know I get whenever that overload is going and I know that there's something more. And so here's. Here's what I'll say that that I have found has helped me and many of the people that come to stations, our program, is we will teach you that goals in and of themselves are not great things, right? Goals are important. You should set them. It's spiritual mission, right? The, you know, they say the hunter that chases two hares loses both. That's because he doesn't funnel them into a path. There's a reason why Spartans could fend off the Persian army so long. They funneled everything down. So if every goal that I set is based towards a spiritual mission, everything is centered around how does what I want and need serve God? You know, you want to buy a truck, figure out how it's how it serves spiritual mission. And when you do that, you start to feel purposeful because, you know, John Rivera wrote a book, um, The Bait of Satan. Yeah. It's all it's all offense, right? Overwhelm is just offense, right? Life is too busy. Blame and shame justify. It's just a bunch of victimhood. But when you have spiritual mission, everything that you do to the best of your ability is centered to spiritual mission. You have such a feeling of purpose and fulfillment that it's very hard to be overwhelmed. Suddenly you'll start to feel overwhelmed by different by all the good things you need to be doing or should be doing. And and then after that, I think it's just about learning delegation and building your skill sets and um Probably the last thing I'll say on that is most importantly, it's just grace, mm. right? You exist in the blink of an eye. So don't, don't, don't be so upset with yourself that you can't get everything done. Your life is very, very short. Yeah. You know, just do what you can and ask God for what you need. Mm. Seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be added to you is exactly what I think Stu is trying to tell us right now in a beautiful way. I love the way you storytell. I love the way that you bring analogies in. This has been such a rich and incredible time. I'm so thankful that you shared today and I have a feeling you're going to be a crowd favorite. So I'll probably have you back for part two. We'd love to be back. Thank you. Thank you. If you found this to be helpful, you can find out so much more in my book, Nervous Breakthrough. And guess what? Right now you can order it on Amazon. Also, can you do something for me? Will you help us get the word out about this podcast? I would be so honored if you would share it with your loved ones, rate it, review it, and also be sure to subscribe. And lastly, and I really mean this, we want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or ideas on something that I should cover or a tip that you'd really like help on, please send us an email podcast at fearlessunite.com. Again, that's podcast at fearlessunite.com. Thank you so much for listening.